Good morning, uh, Roger Lewis here from the Grub Street Journal. And uh, this morning, I'm going to do something slightly different. Um, I've just uh, got this draft blog up, and um, it's uh, The Dunciad by Alexander Pope. Now, I put up a a blog just before this one, uh, which was Pope's essay on man. Um, let's just have a look here. Where where's that one gone? Uh, just refresh this. This is live, and I'm just going to sort of just gently into uh, a reading of the Dunciad. Uh, but just to explain where I'm going with this, here we have <clears throat> the blog I did this morning. So this is uh, an essay on man, um, and the theme is the madness of crowds, really. And uh, this quote from Henry Morley on the version of Essay on Man published by him, uh, the reader of Pope, as of every author, is advised to begin by letting him say what he has to say in his own manner to an open mind that seeks only to receive the impressions which the writer wishes to convey. First, let the mind and spirit of the writer come into free, full contact with the mind and spirit of the reader, whose attitude at the first reading should be simply receptive. Such reading is the condition precedent to all true judgment of a writer's work. All criticism that is not so grounded spreads as fog over a poet's page. Read, read for yourself without once pausing to remember what you've been told to think. And this is a word cloud of the essay on man, um, which if you click that link there, you'll uh, you'll get the the the, the full um, the full book. Um, <clears throat> so I've taken uh, from the Wikipedia um, article, uh, this one here on the essay of man, uh, this is the most often uh, quoted um, passage from Epistle 2, lines 1 to 30. Know then thyself, presume not God to scan the proper study of mankind, his man, placed on this isthmus of a middle state, a being darkly wise and rudely great, with too much knowledge for the sceptic side, with too much weakness for the stoic's pride. He hangs between, in doubt to act or rest, in doubt to deem himself a god or beast, in doubt his mind or body to prefer, born but to die, and reasoning but to err. Alike in ignorance his reasons such, whether he thinks too little or too much, chaos of thought and passion all confused, still by himself abused or disabused, created half to rise and half to fall, great lord of all things, yet a prey to all, sole judge of truth in endless error hurled, the glory jest and riddle of the world. Go, wondrous creature, mount where science guides, Go measure earth, weigh air, and state the tides. Instruct the planets in what orbs to run. Correct old time and regulate the sun. Go soar with Plato to the imperial sphere, to the first good, first perfect, and first fair. Or tread the many round his followers trod, and quitting sense call imitating God as eastern priests in giddy circles run and turn their heads to imitate the sun go teach eternal wisdom how to rule then drop into thyself and be a fool and be a fool uh, which leads us to uh, pope's uh, dunciad and um, the dunciad uh, and the uh, Non de plume, uh, Martin Scriber alias, uh, is a satire on English society and uh, the belle lettre, if you like, the uh, the teenage scribblers of the day. Um, and uh, 
I was thinking and mentioned the essay on men in, in a video I put up two days ago. Um, I'm thinking some more about Grub Street Journal and the work I've done on that for Web3. Um, I actually quoted quite a lot of the Dunciad. Um, and today I thought, well, actually, there must be a reading or a staging of it somewhere. Um, and it's somewhat ironic uh, that I haven't been able to find one, uh, particularly as one of the objects of uh, Pope's um, satire is uh, this man, the poet laureate, uh, laureate um, of, the, uh, uh, of the day, um, uh, who... Um, where are we now? We'll get there in a minute. Um, let me just go down here. I've closed the tab. Um, this essay on man. Uh, let's just get to the the Dunciad here. So. Um, Here we are, Collie Kibber, King of Dunces. Um, and Collie Kibber was the poet laureate um, and also uh, a theatre producer in, in the time of uh, where the Pope was a, uh, a famous uh, writer. And um, it's the likes of Collie Kibber and the dumbing down um, and uh, bastardization of various plays that he put on that quite got um, Alexander Pope's um, blood up, as it were. Um, now, just uh, another thing I've put in this blog is this um, In Our Time episode, talking about Alexander Pope. Um, I haven't listened to it fully yet. I started to listen to it. it, it they're usually very good, these things. Um, but let's bear in mind what Henry um, Morley uh, says, which is read reader for yourself without for a moment pausing to remember what you've been taught to think. So um, let's uh, just get back to this. Uh, this was the draft that, that, that I'd started with. Here, here you see a uh, um an original ed edition um and uh this is uh, from the fourth book of the dunciad um after the argument at line 10 uh now flamed the dog stars unpropitious ray smote every brain and withered every bay sick was the sun the owl forsook his bower the moonstruck prophet felt the maddening hour. Then rose the seed of chaos and of night to blot out order and extinguish light of dull and venal a new world to mould and bring Saturnian days of lead and gold. Um, so we're going to now uh, proceed uh, without further ado um, to the Dunciad, and I'm going to just read uh, all four epistles um, or books and uh, with the introductions. So, ladies and gentlemen, The Dunciad, book the first to Dr. Jonathan Swift, argument. The proposition, the invocation and the inscription, then the original of the great empire of dullness and cause of the continuous thereof the college of the goddess in the city with her private academy for poets in particular the governors of it and the four cardinal virtues then the poem hastes into the midst of things presenting her on the evening of a lord mayor's day revolving the long succession of her sons and the glories past and to come she fixes her eye on bays to be the instrument of that great event which is the subject of the poem. He is described pensive among his books, giving up the cause and apprehending the period of her empire after debating whether to betake himself to the church or to gaming or to party writing. 
he raises an altar of proper books and making first his solemn prayer and declaration proposes thereon to sacrifice all his unsuccessful writings as the pile is kindled the goddess beholding the flame from her seat flies and puts it out by casting upon it the poem of thule she forthwith reveals herself to him transports him to her temple unfolds her arts and initiates him into her mysteries then announcing the death of Euston, the poet laureate anoints him carries him to court and proclaims him successor the mighty mother and her son who brings the smithfield muses to the ear of kings i sing say you her instruments the great called to this work by dullness jove and fate you by whose care in vain decried and cursed still dunce the second reigns like dunce the first say how the goddess bade britannia sleep and poured her spirit o'er the land and deep in eldest time er mortals writ or read er palace issued from the thunderer's heed dullness o'er all possessed her ancient right daughter of chaos and eternal night fate in their dotage this fair idiot gave gross as her sire and as her mother's grave laborious heavy busy bold and blind she ruled in native anarchy the mind still her old empire to restore she tries for born a goddess dullness never dies O oh, thou whatever title please thine ear dean drapier bickerstaff or gulliver whether thou choose Cervantes, a serious air, or laugh and shake in Reble easy chair, or praise the court or magnify mankind, or thy grieved country's copper chains unbind. From thy Beatica, thou her power retires. Mourn not my swift at aught our realm acquires. Here, please behold her mighty wings outspread to hatch a new Saturnian age of lead. Close to those walls where folly holds her throne, and laughs to think Monroe would take her down, where o'er the gates by his famed father's hand, great Sibber's brazen brainless brothers stand. One cell there is concealed from vulgar eye, the cave of poverty and poetry. Keen hollow winds howl through the bleak recess, emblem of music caused by emptiness. Hence bards, like Proteus long in vain tied down, escape in monsters and amaze the town. Hence miscellany's spring, the weekly boast of curls chased press and lintot's rubric post. Hence hymning Tyburn's elegic lines, hence journals, medleys, mercury's magazines, sepulchral lies, our holy walls to grace, and New Year odes, and all the Grub Street race. In clouded majesty, here dullness shone, four guardian virtues round support her throne, fierce champion fortitude, that knows no fears of hisses, blows, or want, or loss of ears. Calm temperance, whose blessings those partake, who hunger and who thirst for scribbling sake. Prudence, whose glass presents the approaching jail, poetic justice with her lifted scale. Where in nice balance, truth with gold she weighs, and solid pudding against empty praise here she beholds the chaos dark and deep when nameless somethings in their causes sleep till genial jacob or a warm third day call forth each mass a poem or a play how hints like spawn scarce quick in embryo lie how newborn nonsense first is taught to cry maggots half-formed 
in rhyme exactly meet and learn to crawl upon poetic feet. Here one poor word and hundred clenches makes and ductile dullness no meanders takes. There motley images her fancy strike, figures ill-paired and similes unlike. She sees a mob of metaphors advance, pleased with the madness of the mazy dance. How tragedy and comedy embrace, how farce and epic get a jumbled race. How time himself stands still at her command, realms shift their place, and ocean turns to land. Here gay description Egypt glads with showers, or gives to Zembla fruits to Barker flowers, glittering with ice. Here hoary hills are seen, there painted valleys or eternal green, in cold December fragrant chaplets blow, and heavy harvests nod beneath the snow. All these and more the cloud-compelling queen beholds through fogs that magnify the scene. She tinselled o'er in robes of varying hues, with self-applause her wild creation views, sees momentary monsters rise and fall, and with her fool's colours gilds them all. T'was on the day when furled rich and grave, like Sim and Triumph both on land and wave, Pomps without guilt of bloodless swords and maces, glad chains, warm furs, broad banners and broad faces. Now night descending, the proud scene was o'er, but lived in settles numbers one day more. Now mares and shreves, all hushed and satiate lay, yet eat in dreams the custard of the day, while pensive poets painful vigils keep sleepless themselves to give their readers sleep. Much to the mindful queen the feast recalls what city swans once sung within the walls. Much she revolves their arts, their ancient praise, and sure succession down from Hayward's days she saw with joy the line immortal run, each sire impressed and glaring in his son. So watchful Bruin forms with plastic care, each growing lump and brings it to bear. She saw old Prin in restless Daniel shine, and Euston eke out Blakemore's endless line. She saw slow Phillips creep like Tate's poor page, and all the mighty mad in Dennis rage. In each she marks her image full express but chief in Bayes's monster breathing breast, Bayes formed by nature's stage and town to bless, and act and be a coxcomb with success. Dullness with transport eyes the lively dunce, remembering she herself was pertness once. Now shame to fortune, an ill run at play, blanked his bold visage and a thin third day, swearing and supperless the hero sate, blasphemed his gods, the dice, and damned his fate, then gnawed his pen, then dashed it on the ground, sinking from thought to thought, a vast profound, plunged from his sense, but found no bottom there, yet wrote and floundered on in mere despair, round him much embryo, much abortion lay, much future owed, and adabiactic play, Nonsense precipitate like running lead that slipped through cracks and zigzags of the head. All that on folly frenzy could beget, fruits of dull heat and suitorkins of wit. Next, o'er his books, his eyes began to roll in pleasing memory of all he stole. How here he sipped, how there he plundered snug and sucked all o'er like an industrious bug. Here lay poor Fletcher's half-eat scenes, and here the frippery of crucified Moliere. There hapless Shakespeare, yet of Tybalt saw, wished he had blotted for himself before. The rest on outside merit but presume, or serve like other fools to fill a room. Such with their shelves as due proportion hold, or their fond parents dressed in red and gold or where the pictures for the page atone, and quarrels is saved by beauties not his own. 
Here swells the shelf of Ogilby the Great. There, stamped with arms, Newcastle shines complete. Here all his suffering brotherhood retire and scape the martyrdom of shakes and fire. A Gothic library of Greece and Rome, well purged and worthy settle banks and broom. But high above, more solid learning shone the classics of an age that heard of none. There Caxton slept with Winken at his side. One clasped in wood and one in strong cowhide. There saved by spice like mummies many a year. Dry bodies of divinity appear. Delira there a dreadful front extends. And here the groaning shelves Philemon bend. And these twelve volumes, twelve of ampler size, redeemed from tapers and defrauded pies, inspired he seizes these an altar raise, an hetacom of pure unsullied lays, that altar crowns a folio commonplace, founds the whole pile of all his works the base. Quattro's octavos shape the lessening pyre, a twisted birthday ode completes the spire. Then he, great tamer of all human art, first in my care and ever at my heart, dullness whose good old cause I yet defend, with whom my muse began, with whom shall end, Er, uh, since Sir Fopling's periwig was praised to the last honours of the button bays, O oh, thou of business, the directing soul, to this our head like bias to the bowl, which, as more ponderous, made its aim more true, obliquely waddling to the mark in view. O oh, ever gracious to perplexed mankind, still spread a healing mist before the mind, and lest we err by wits while dancing light, secure us kindly in our native night. Or, if to wit a coxcomb make pretence, guard the sure barrier between that and sense, or quite unravel all the reasoning thread and hang some curious cobweb in its stead, as forced from wind guns Lee led itself can fly, and ponderous slugs cut swiftly through the sky, as clocks to wait their nimble motion owe, the wheels above urged by the load below, me emptiness and dullness could inspire, and were my elasticity and fire, some demon stole my pen, forgive the offence, and once betrayed me into common sense. Else all my prose and verse were much the same. This prose on stilts, that poetry fallen lame, did on the stage my fops appear confined. My life gave ampler lessons to mankind. Did the dead letter unsuccessful prove? The brisk example never failed to move. Yet sure had heaven decreed to save the state. Heaven had decreed those works a longer date. Could Troy be saved by any single hand? This grey goose weapon must have made her stand. What can I now, my Fletcher cast aside, take up the Bible once my better guide, or tread the path by venturous heroes trod, this box my thunder, this right hand my god, or chaired at white's amidst the doctor's sit, teach oaths to gamesters and to nobles wit, or bits thou rather to party to embrace, a friend to party thou and all her race, tis the same rope at different ends they twist, to Duchess Ridpath is as dear as mist, shy like curtains, desperate in my zeal, her head and ears plunge from the common wheel. Oh, Rob Rome's ancient geese of all their glories, and cackling save the monarchy of Tories, hold to the minister I more incline to serve his cause, O Queen, is serving thine. And see thy very gazetteers give o'er, uh, even Ralph repents and Henley writes no more. What then remains? Ourself still, still remain, Siberian forehead and Siberian brain, this brazen brightness to the squire so dear, 
this polished hardness that reflects the beer, this arch absurd, that wit and fool delights, this mess tossed up of hockley hole and whites, where dukes and butchers join to reap my crown, at once the bear and fiddle of the town. O oh, born in sin and forth in folly brought, works damned to be damned your father's fault. Go, purified by flames, ascend the sky, my better and more Christian progeny, unstained, untouched, and yet in maiden sheets, while all your smutty sisters walk the streets. Ye shall not beg like gratis given bland, sent with a pass and vagrant through the land, nor sail with ward to ape and monkey climes, where vile mundungus trucks for viler rhymes. Not sulphur tipped in blaze and alehouse fire, not wrap up oranges to pelt your sire. O oh, pass more innocent in infant state to the mild limbo of our father Tate, or peaceably forgot at once he bless in Shadwell's bosom with eternal rest, soon to that mass of nonsense to return, where things destroyed are swept to things unborn. With that, a tear, portentous sign of grace, stole from the master of a sevenfold face, and thrice he lifted high the birthday brand, and thrice he dropped it from his quivering hand, then lights the structure with averted eyes. The rolling smoke involves the sacrifice. The opening clouds disclose each work by turns. Now flames the Cid, and now Parola burns. Great Caesar roars and hisses in the fires. King John in silence modestly expires. No merit now, the dear Nonjour claims. Moliere's old stubble in a moment flames. Tears gushed again as from pale Priam's eyes when the blaze sent Ilion to the skies. Roused by the light, old dullness heaved the head, then snatched a sheet of fool from her bed. Sudden she flies and whelms it o'er the pyre. Down sink the flames and with a hiss expire. Her ample presence fills up all the place. A veil of fogs dilates her awful face. Great in her charms as when on shreves and mares she looks and breathes herself into their airs. She bids him wait her to her set sacred dome well pleased he entered and confessed his home so spirits ending their terrestrial race ascend and recognize their native place this the great mother dearer held than all the clubs of quidnunx or her own guild hall here stood her opium here she nursed her owls and here she planned the imperial seat of fools here to her chosen all her works she shows, prose swelled to verse, verse loitering into prose. How random thoughts now meaning chance to find, now leave all memory of sense behind. How prologues into prefaces decay, and these to notes are frittered quite away. How index learning turns no student pale, yet holds the eel of science by the tail. How with less reading than makes felons scrape. Less human genius than God gives an ape. Small thanks to France and none to Rome or Greece. A past vamped future, old revived new peace. Twixt Plautus, Fletcher, Shakespeare and Corniel can make a Sibber, Tybalt or Ozell. The goddess then o'er his anointed head with mystic words and sacred opium shed, and lo, her bird, a monster of a fowl, something betwixt a Heidegger and an owl, perched on his crown, all hail and hail again, my son, she promised land, expects thy reign. No, Euston thirsts, no more for sack or praise, he sleeps among the dull of ancient days, safe where no critics damn, no duns molest, where wretched withers ward and gilden rest, and high-born Howard, more majestic sire, with fool of quality completes the choir. Thou, Sibber, thou, his laurel shalt support, 
folly, my son, has still a friend at court. Lift up your gates, ye princes, see him come. Sound, sound, ye walls, be the cat called dumb. Bring, bring the madding bay, the drunken vine, the creeping, dirty, courtly ivy join. And thou, his aide de camp, lead on my sons, light armed with points, antitheses and puns. Let Baudry Billingsgate, my daughter's dear, support his front and oaths bring up the rear. And under his and under Archer's wing, gaming and grub street skulk behind the king oh when shall rise a monarch all our own and i a nursing mother rock the throne twixt prince and people close the curtain draw shade him from light and cover him from law fatten the courtier starve the learned band and suckle armies and dry nurse the land till senates nod to lullabies divine and all be sleep as at an ode of thine. She ceased, then swells the chapel royal throat. God save King Kibar, mounts in every note. Familiar whites, God save King Collie cries. God save King Collie, Drury Lane replies. To Needham's quick, the voice triumphal rode, but pious Needham dropped the name of God. Back to the devil the last echoes roll and call each butcher roars at hockley hole so when jove's block descended from on high as sings thy great forefather ogle my loud thunder to its bottom shook the bog and the horse nation croaked god save king log there are some variations uh, then which i'm not going to read the variations. Wow, that's powerful stuff. It's a satire on the press of the day, a satire on the thought leaders of the day, this whole artifice of replacing truth with nonsense. Um, it's so apt for the present time. I mean, I, I, I think anyone that's got this far listening to this will actually realise that uh, history is not but repeating itself. It's plagiarising itself. Um, uh, it was Marx that said that history repeats itself first as tragedy, then as farce. Um, and absurdity rules at present it's a kafkaesque dystopian idiocracy if you've seen the film idiocracy it, it's a modern take on all the things that the that, that pope he, he's not merely poking fun here pope it, it's um the frustration of complete and utter despair of the depths of depravity which the elite of his time and the elite of our time i mean this is a poem for all ages and all corrupted greed anyway let, let's get back to, let's get back to to, to, to pope Book the second argument. The king being proclaimed, the solemnity is graced with public games and sports of various kinds, not instituted by the hero as by Aeneas in Virgil, but for greater honour by the goddess in person, in like manner as the games, Pythia, Ithmia, and etc., were anciently said to be ordained by the gods. And as Thetis herself appearing, according to Homer, Odius uh, 24, proposed the prizes in honour of her son Achilles. Hither flock the poets and critics, attended as it is, but just with their patrons and booksellers. The goddess is first pleased for her disport to propose games to the booksellers, and setteth 
up the phantom of a poet, which they contend to overtake. The race is described with their divers, diverse accidents, next the game for a poetess, then follow the exercises for the poets of tickling, vociferating, diving. The first holds forth the arts and practices of dedicators, the second of disputants and Faustian poets, and third of profound dark and dirty party writers. Lastly, for the critics, the goddess proposes with great propriety an exercise not of their parts, but their patience, in hearing the works of two voluminous authors, one in verse and the other in prose, deliberately read without sleeping. The various effects of which, with the several degrees and manners of their operation, are here set forth, till the whole number, not of critics only, but of spectators, actors and all present, fall fast asleep, which naturally and necessarily ends the games. High on a gorgeous seat that far outshone Henley's gilt tub or Flecknoe's Irish phone, or that where on her curls the public pours all bounteous fragrant grains and golden showers. Great Sibber sate the proud Parnassian sneer, the conscious simper and the jealous leer. Mix on his look, all eyes direct their rays on him, and crowds turn coxcombs as they gaze. His peers shine round him with reflected grace, new edge their dullness, and new bronze their face. So from the sun's broad beam in shallow urns, heaven's twinkling sparks draw light and point their horns. Not with more glee by hands pontific crowned, with scarlet hats wide waving circled round, Rome in her capital saw Querno sit, throned on seven hills, the Antichrist of wit. And now the queen, to glad her sons, proclaims by Herald Hawker's high heroic game. They summon all her race, an endless band, pours forth, and leaves unpeopled half the land. A motley mixture in long wigs, in bags, in silks, in crepes, in garters and in rags. From drawing rooms, from colleges, from garrets, on horse, on foot, in hacks and gilded chariots. All who true dunces in her cause appeared, and all who knew those dunces to reward. Amid that area wide they took their stand, where the tall maypole once o'erlooked the strand. But now, so Anne and piety ordain, a church collects the saints of Drury Lane. With authors, stationers obeyed the call, the field of glory is a field for all. Glory and gain the industrious tribe provoke, and gentle dullness ever loves a joke. A poet's form she placed before their eyes, and bade the nimblest racer seize the prize. No meagre muse rid mope, a dust and thin, in a dun nightgown of his own loose skin. But such a bulk as no twelve bards could raise, twelve starveling bards of these degenerate days, all as a partridge plump full fed and fair, she formed this image of well-bodied air. With pert flat eyes she windowed well its head, a brain of feathers and a heart of lead. And empty words she gave and sounding strain, but senseless, lifeless, idle, void and vain, never was dashed out at one lucky hit. A fool, so just a copy of a wit, so like that critic said, and courtier swore, a wit it was, and called the phantom more. All gaze with ardour, some a poet's name, others a sword knot and laced suit in flame. But lofty lintot in the circle rose, this prize is mine, who tempted are my foes. With me began this genius, and shall end, he spoke. And who with Lintot shall contend? Fear held them moot 
alone, untaught to fear, stood dauntless curl, behold that rival fear. The race by vigour, not by vaunts, is won. So take the hindmost hell, he said, and run. Swift as a bard, the bailiff leaves behind. He left huge lintot and outstripped the wind, as when a dad chick waddles through the copse on feet and wings and flies and wades and hops, so labouring on with shoulders, hands and head, wide as a windmill, all his figure spread. With arms expanded, Bernard rose his state, and left leg Jacob seems to emulate. Full in the middle way there stood a lake, with curls Carina, charms that mourn to make. Such was her wont at early dawn to drop her evening cates before his neighbour's shop. Her fortune curled to sly, a loud shout the band, and Bernard, Bernard rings through all the strand, obscene with filth and miscreant lies bewrayed, fallen in the plash his wickedness had laid. Then first, if poet aught of truth declare, the caitiff vaticide conceived a prayer. Here, Joe, whose name by bards and I adore, as much at least as any gods or more, and him and his, if more devotion warms, down with the Bible, up with the Pope's arms. A place there is betwixt earth, air, and seas, where from Ambrosia Jove retires for ease. There is his seat to spacious fence appear, on this he sits, to that he leans his ear, and hears the various vows of fond mankind. Some beg an eastern, some a western wind, all vain petitions mounting to the sky, with reams abundant, this abode supply. Amused he reads, and then returns the bills, signed with that ichor, which from gods distills. In office here fair, Clasina stands, and ministers to Jove with purest hands. Forth from the heap she picked her votary's prayer, and placed it next him, a distinction rare. Oft had the goddess heard her servants call, from her black grottoes near the temple wall, listening delighted to the jest unclean, of link boys vile and watermen obscene. Whereas he fished her nether realms for wit, she oft had favoured him, and favours yet, renewed by orders, sympathetic force, as oils with magic juices for the course, vigorous he rises from the effluvia strong, imbibes new life and scours and stinks along, repasses lintot, vindicates the race, nor heeds the brown dishonours of his face. And now the victor stretched his eager hand, where the tall nothing stood or seemed to stand, a shapeless shade it melted from his sight, like forms in clouds or visions of the night. To seize his paper's curl was next thy care, his paper's light fly diverse tossed in air. Songs, sonnets, epigrams the winds uplift, and whisk them back to Evans young and swift, the embroidered suit at least he deemed his prey, that suit an unpaid tailor snatched away, no rag, no scrap of all the bow, or wit that once so fluttered and that once so writ. Heaven rings with laughter, oh, the laughter vain, dullness, good queen, repeats the jest again. Three wicked imps of her own Grub Street choir, she decked like Congreve, Addison and Pryor, Mears, Warner, Wilkins, Rund, elusive thought, brave old Bond, Beersleel, the varlet's court, Curl stretches after Gay, but Gay is gone. He grasps an empty Joseph for a John. So Proteus hunted in a nobler shape, became when seized a puppy or an ape. To him, the goddess son, thy grief laid down, and turned this whole illusion on the town, as the sage dame experienced in her trade by names of toast retails, each battered jade. Whence hapless monsieur much complains at Paris of wrongs from duchesses and lady Maris. Be thine, my stationer, this magic gift. Cook shall be prior, and Concanian swift. So shall each hostile name become our own, and we to boost our Garth and Addison. 
With that she gave him piteous of his case, yet smiling at his rueful length of face, a shaggy tapestry worthy to be spread on Codrus old and or Dunton's modern bed, instructive work whose wry mouth portraiture displayed the fates her confessors endure. Earless on high stood unabashed the foe, and Tuchin flagrant from the scourge below, their rid Pathropa cudgelled might ye view, the very worst did still look black and blue, himself among the story chiefs he spies, as from the blanket high in air he flies, and oh, he cried, what street, what lane, but knows, our purgings, pumpings, blanketings and blows, in every loom our labours shall be seen, and the fresh vomit run from every green. See in the circle next Eliza placed, Two babes of love closing, close clinging to her waist. Fair as before her work she stands confessed, In flowers and pearls my bounteous kirkle dressed. The goddess then, who best can send on high, The salient spout far streaming to the sky. His beyond Juno of majestic size, With cow-like udders and with ox-like eyes, This China Jordan let the chief her uh, come, Replenish not invigorously at home ingloriously at home. Osborne and Curl accept the glorious strife, though this his son dissuades and that his wife. One on his manly confidence relies, on one on his vigour and superior size. First Osborne leaned against his lettered post, it rose and laboured to a curve at most. So Joe's bright bow displays in watery round, sure sign that no spectator shall be drowned. A second effort brought but new disgrace. The wild meander washed the artist's face. Thus the small jet, with hasty hands unlock, spurts in the gardener's eyes, who turns the cock. Not so from shameless curl, impetuous spread the stream, and smoking flourished o'er his head, so famed like thee for turbulence and horns. Eridanus, his humble fountain scorns, through half the heavens he pours the exalted urn, his rapid waters in their passage burn. Swift as it mounts, all follow with their eyes, still happy impudence obtains the prize. Thou triumphst, victor, of the high-wrought day, and the pleased dame soft smiling leads away. Osborne, through perfect modesty o'er come, crowned with the Jordan, walks contented home. But now for author's nobler palms remain room for my lord three jockeys in his train six huntsmen with a shout precede his chair he grins and looks broad nonsense with a stare his honour's meaning dullness thus expressed his wins this patron who can tickle best he chinks his purse and takes his seat of state with ready quills the dedicators wait now at his head the dexterous task commence an instant fancy feels the imputed sense now gentle touches wanton o'er his face he struts adonis and affects grimace rowly the feather to his ear conveys then his nice taste directs our operas bently his mouth with classic flattery opes and the puffed orator bursts out in tropes but whilst did most the poet's healing balm strives to extract from his soft giving palm unlucky wellstead thy unfeeling master the more thou ticklest gripes his fist the faster while thus each hand promotes the pleasing pain, and quick sensation skip from vein to vein, a youth unknown to Phibius in despair, puts his last refuge all in heaven and prayer. What force have power pious vows, the queen of love, her sister sends her votress from above, as taught by Venus, Paris learned the art, to touch Achilles' only tender part. Secure through her the noble prize to carry, he marches off his grace's secretary. Now turn to different sports, the goddess cries, and learn, my sons, the wondrous power of noise, to move, to raise, to ravish every heart with Shakespeare's nature or with Johnson's art. 
let others aim, tis yours to shake the soul, with thunder rumbling from the mustard bowl, with horns and trumpets now to madness swell, now sink in sorrows with a tolling bell, such happy arts attention can command, when fancy flags and senses at a stand, improve we these, Three cat calls be the bribe of him whose chattering shames the monkey tribe. And this, his drum, those hoarse heroic bass, drowns the loud clarion of the braying ass. Now a thousand tongues are heard in one loud din. The monkey mimics rush discordant in. Twas chattering, grinning, mouthing, jabbering all. A noise and naught and brangling and brival. Dennis and dissonance and captious art. And snip snap short and interruption smart. And demonstration thin and theses thick. A major, minor and conclusion quick. Hold! cried the queen, a cat call each shall win, equal your merits, equal is your din, but that this well disputed game may end, sound forth nay brayers, and the welkin rend, as when the long-eared milky mothers wait, at some sick miser's triple bolted gate, for their defrauded absent foals they make, a moan so loud that all the guild awake, Saw, sighs Sir Gilbert, starting at the bray, from dreams of millions and three groats to pay. So swells each windpipe, ass in tones to ass, harmonic twang of leather horn and brass, such as from labouring lungs the enthusiast blows, high sound attempered to the vocal nose, or such as bellow from the deep divine, there Webster pealed thy voice and Whitfield thine, but far o'er all sonorous Blackmore's strain, walls, steeple skies bray back to him again, in Tottenham fields the brethren with amaze, prick all their ears up and forget to graze, long chancery lane retentive rolls the sound and courts to courts return it round and round thames wafts in thence to rufus roaring hall and hungerford re-echoes ball for ball all hail him victor in both gifts of song who sings so loudly and who sings so long this labour past by bridewell all descend as morning prayer and flagellation end to where fleet ditch with disemboguing streams rolls the large tribute of dead dogs to thames the king of dykes than whom no sluice of mud with deeper sable blots the silver flood here strip my children here at once leap in here prove who best can dash through thick and thin and who the most in love of dirt excel or dark dexterity of groping well who flings most filth and wide pollutes around the stream be his the weekly journals bound a pig of lead to him who dives the best a peck of coals apiece shall glad the rest in naked majesty old Mixon stands and milo like surveys his arms and hands then sighing thus and am i now three score ah why ye gods should two and two make four he said and climbed a stranded lighter's height shot to the black abyss and plunged downright the seniors judgment all the crowd admire who but to sink the deeper rose the higher next smedley dive slow circles dimpled o'er the quaking mud that closed and oped no more all look all sigh and call on smedley lost smedley in vain resounds through all the coast then hill essayed scarce vanished out of sight he buoys up distant and returns to light he bears no token of the sable streams and mounts far off among the swans of thames true to the bottom seek on canaan creep a cold long-winded native of the deep in perseverance gain the diver's prize not everlasting blackmore this denies no noise no stir no motion canst thou make the unconscious stream sleeps o'er thee like a lake next plunged a feeble but a desperate pack 
with each a sickly brother at his back sons of a day just buoyant on the flood then numbered with the puppies in the mud ask ye their names i could as soon disclose the names of these blind puppies as of those fast by like Niobe, her children gone sits mother osborne stupefied to stone and monumental brass this record bears these are ah no these were the gazetteers not so bold arnold with the weight of skull furious he dies precipitately dull whirlpools and storms his circling arm in best with all the might of gravitation blessed. No crab more active in the dirty dance, downward to climb and backward to advance. He brings up half the bottom on his head and loudly claims the journals and the lead. The plunging prelate and his ponderous grace with holy envy gave one layman place. When lo, a burst of thunder shook the flood, slow rose a form in majesty of mud, shaking the horrors of his sable brows, and each ferocious feature grim with ooze. Greater he looks, and more than mortal stares, then thus the wonders of the deep declares. First he relates how sinking to the chin, smit with his mien, the mud nymph sucked him in, how young Lutetia, softer than the down, Negrina black and Murdamte brown vied for his love in jetty bowers below, as Hyla's fair was ravished long ago. Then sung how shown him by the nut brown maids, a branch of sticks here rises from the shades that tinctured as it runs with Leith's stream, and wafting vapours from the land of dreams, as under sea Althus secret sluice bears pisa's offering to his arathus pours into thames and hence the mingled wave intoxicates the pert and lulls the grave here briskier vapors o'er the temple creed they're all from paul's to algate drink and sleep thence to the banks where reverend bards repose they led him soft each reverend bard arose and millborn chief deputed by the rest, gave him the cassock, surcingle and vest. Receive, he said, these robes which once were mine, dullness is sacred, inner sound divine. He ceased and spread the robe, the crowd confessed, the reverend flamen and his lengthened dress. Around him wide a sable army stand, a low-born cell-bred, selfish, servile band, prompt or to guard or stab, to saint or damn, Heaven's Swiss who fight for any god or man. Through Lud's famed gates, along the well-known fleet, rolls the black troop and overshades the street, till showers of sermons, characters, essays, encircling fleeces whiten all the ways, so clouds replenish from some bog below, mount in dark volumes and descend in snow. Here stop the goddess and in pomp proclaims a gentler exercise to close the games. Ye critics in whose heads as equal scales I weigh what author's heaviness prevails, which most conduce to soothe the soul in slumbers, my Henley's periods or my Blackmore's numbers. Attend the trial we propose to make. If there be man who o'er such works can wait, sleeps all subduing charms who dares defy and boasts ulysses ear with argus eye to him we grant our armless powers to sit judge of all present past and future wit to cavail censure dictate right or wrong full and eternal privilege of tongue three college sophs and three pert templars came the same their talents and their tastes the same each prompt to query, answer, and debate, and smit with love of poesy and prate. The ponderous books to gentle readers bring, the heroes sit, the vulgar form a ring. The clamorous crowd is hushed with mugs of mum, till all tuned equal send the general hum. Then mount the clerks, and in one lazy tone, through the long, heavy, painful page, draw on. Soft, 
creeping words on words the sense compose of every line they stretch they yawn they doze as to soft gales top heavy pines bow low their heads and lift them as they cease to blow thus oft they rear and oft the head decline as breathe or pause by fits the airs divine and now to this side now to that they nod as verse or prose infuse the drowsy god thrice budgel aimed to speak but thrice suppressed by potent arthur knocked his chin and breast tolland and tyndall prompt at priests to jeer yet silent bowed to christ no kingdom here who sate the nearest by the words her come slept first the distant nodded to the hum then down a rolled the book stretched o'er and lies each gentle clerk and muttering seals his eyes as what of dutchman plumps into the lakes one circle first and then a second makes what dullness dropped among her sons impressed like motion from one circle to the rest so from the midmost the nutation spreads round and more round all the sea of heads at last saint livre felt her voice to fail moto himself unfinished left his tail boyer the state and law the stage gave o'er morgan and mandeville could prate no more norton from daniel and austria sprung blessed with his father's front and mother's tongue hung silent down his never blushing head and all was hushed as polly's self lay dead thus the soft gifts of sleep conclude the day and stretched on bulks as usual poets lay why should i sing what bards the nightly muse did slumbering visit and convey to stews who prouder marched with magistrates in state to some famed round house ever open gate how henley lay inspired beside a sink and to mere mortal seemed a priest in drink while others timely to the neighbouring fleet haunt of the muses made their safe retreat Whew. right oh my word well I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a break because I'm finding this really quite draining. Um, I mean, I've read this before when I was, when I read it last year um, in the autumn. Uh, and I've dipped into it over the years prior to that. But I've never sort of done a live reading of it. And uh, it could have been written today. You could change a few names in there. Um, Rockwood's having a go at Fleet Street again. Um, I mean, Pope has a go at absolutely everybody, and everybody at the moment deserves to be had a go at. So, you know, I'm sure as people listen to the words and these names, they will be replacing people like. Piers Morgan, perhaps, uh, Robert Peston. In America, it will be, um, what's he called, Acosta, you know, the White House Press Corps, etc. Um, but anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have a break. And during that break, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put this on. This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to BBC. But a man who wanted to be as John Watson when set out to be a great poet thinks that they are worth my life to take on in a major poem. There we are. Uh, finish that break. I'll put the link to that in the description. Um, and uh, maybe play some more of it after uh, I continue the, the reading. 
So I hope you're enjoying this. If anybody is watching this, I've no idea if anyone's watching it. I'll put it on my BitChute channel afterwards as well. Um, I did do a live stream the other day, which is on my YouTube channel, and it's just taking forever to process on BitChute. So uh, we'll see how we go, how we go with with this one as well. Um, so let's get on to book three. Um, so book the third. Argument. After the other persons are disposed of their proper places of rest, the goddess transports the king to her temple and there lays him to slumber with his head on her lap, a position of marvellous virtue which causes all the visions of wild enthusiasts, projectors, politicians, inamoratos, castle builders, chemists and poets. He is immediately carried on the wings of fancy and led by a mad poetical sibyl to the Lycian shade, where on the banks of Ley, the souls of the dull are dipped by Bagus before their entrance into this world. There he is met by the ghosts of Settle, and by him made acquainted with the wonders of the place, and with those which he himself is destined to perform. He takes him to a mount of vision, from whence he shows him the past triumphs of the empire of dullness, then the present, and lastly the future how small a part of the world was ever conquered by science, how soon those conquests were stopped and those very nations again reduced to her dominion. Then distinguishing the island of Great Britain shows by what aids, by what persons and by what degrees it shall be brought to her empire. Some of the persons he causes to pass in review before his eyes, describing each by his proper figure, character and qualifications. On a sudden, the scene shifts and a vast number of miracles and prodigies appear, utterly surprising and unknown to the king himself, till they are explained to be the wonders of his own reign now commencing. On this subject, Settle breaks into a congratulation, yet not unmixed with concern that his own times were but the types of these. He prophesies how first the nation shall be overrun with farces, operas and shows, how the throne of dullness shall be advanced over the theatres and set up even at court, then how her son shall preside in the seats of arts and sciences, giving a glimpse of the or, or pisgah sight of the future fullness of her glory, the accomplishment whereof is the subject of the fourth and last book. But in her temple's last recess enclosed, on dullness lap the anointed head reposed. Him closed the curtains round with vapours blue, and soft besprinkles with Cimmerian dew. Then raptures high the seat of sense o'erflow, which only heads refined from reason know. Hence from the straw where Bedlam's prophet nods, he hears loud oracles and talks with gods. Hence the fool's paradise, the statesman's scheme, the air-built castle and the golden dream, the maid's romantic wish, the chemist's flame, and poet's vision of eternal flame. And now on fancy's easy wing conveyed, the king descending views the Elysian shade, a slip-shod sibyl led his steps along, in lofty madness meditating song, her tresses staring from poetic dreams, and never washed but in Castalia's streams. Taylor, their better Sharon lends an oar, once swan of Thames, though now he sings no more. Benlow's propitious still to blockheads bows, and Shadwell nods the poppy on his prows. Here in a dusky vale, where Leith rolls, old Bavus sits to dip poetic souls and blunt the sense and fit it for a skull of solid proof impenetrably dull instant when dipped away they wing their flight where brown and mears and barbed gates of light demand new bodies and in calf's array rush to the world impatient for the day millions and millions on those banks he views thick as the stars of night or morning dews as thick as bees or vernal blossoms fly as thick as eggs at ward in pillory wondering he gazed 
when low a sage appears by his broad shoulders known and the length of ears known by the band and suit which settle war his only suit for twice three years before all as the vest appeared the wearer's frame old in new state another yet the same bland and familiar as in life begun thus the great father to the greater son O born to see what none can see awake behold the wonders of the oblivious lake though yet unborn hast touched this sacred shore the hand of bavius drenched thee o'er and o'er but blind to former as to future fate what mortal knows his pre-existent state who knows how long thy transmigrating soul might from bithyan to bethyan roll how many dutchmen she vouchsafed to third how many stages through old monks she rid and all who since in mild benighted days mixed the owl's ivy with the poet's bays as man's meanders to the vital spring roll all their tides then back their circles bring or whirlywigs twirled round by skilful swain suck the thread in then yield it out again all nonsense thus of old or modern date shall in the centre from thee circulate for this our queen unfolds to vision true thy mental eye for thou hast much to view old scenes of glory times lost long cast behind shall first recalled rush forward to thy mind then stretch thy sight o'er all thy rising reign and let the past and future fire thy brain ascend this hill whose cloudy point commands her boundless empire over seas and lands see round the poles where keener spangles shine where spices smoke beneath the burning line earth's wide extremes her sable flagged displayed and all the nations covered in her shade far eastward cast thine eye from whence the sun and orient science their bright course begun one godlike monarch all that pride confounds he whose long wall the wandering tartar bounds heavens what a pile whose ages perish there and one bright blaze turns learning into air thence to the south extend thy gladdened eyes their rival frames with glory rise from shelves to shelves see greedy vulcan roll and lick up all their psychic of the soul how little mark that portion of the ball where faint at best the beams of science fall soon as they dawn from hyperborean skies embodied dark what clouds of vandals rise lo where Maesha sleeps and hardly flows the freezing tanais through a waste of snows the north by myriads pour her mighty sons great nurse of goths of alans and of huns see alaric's stern port the martial frame of genseric and attila's dread name see the bold ostrogoths of latium fall see the fierce visigoths of spain and gaul see where the morning gilds the palmy shore the soil that arts and infant letters bore his conquering tribes the arabian prophet draws and saving ignorance in thrones by laws see christians jews one heavy sabbath keep and all the western world believe and sleep lo rome herself proud mistress now no more of arts but thundering against heathen law her grey-haired synod's damning books unread and bacon trembling from his brazen head padua with sighs beholds her livy burn and e'en the antipodes Vir virgilius mourn see the cirque fair falls the unpillared temple nods streets paved with heroes tiber choked with gods till peter's keys some christened love jove adorn and pan to moses lends his pagan horn see graceless venus to a virgin turned or phidias broken and apels burned behold yon isle by palmer's pilgrims trod men bearded bold cowled uncold shod unshod peeled patched and piebald linsey woolsey brothers grave mummers sleeveless some and shirtless others that once was britain happy had she seen no fiercer sons had easter ever been 
In peace, great goddess, ever be adored, how keen the war, if dullness draw the sword, thus visit not thy own on this blessed age, O spread thy influence, but restrain thy rage. O see, my son, the hour is on its way, that lifts our goddess to imperial sway, this favourite isle long served from her reign, dove-like she gathers to her wings again. Now look through fate, behold the scene she draws, what aids, what armies to assert her cause. See all her brogyny, illustrious sight, behold and count them as they rise to light. As Bersinthia, while her offspring vie in homage to the mother of the sky, surveys around her in the blessed abode, and hundred sons and every son a god, not with less glory mighty dullness crowned, shall take through Grub Street her triumphant round, and her par Parnosus glancing are at once behold an hundred sons and each a dunce. Mark first that youth who takes the foremost place and thrusts his person full into your face, with all thy father's virtues blessed be born, and a new Sibba shall the stage adorn. A second sea by meeker manners known, and modest as the maid that sips alone from the strong fate of drams, if thou get free, another defray ward shall sing in thee. Thee shall each alehouse, thee each gill house mourn, and answering gin shops sour sighs return. Jacob the scourge of grammar mark with awe, nor less revere him blunderbuss of law. Low popple's brow tremendous to the town, Hornex' fair eye and room's funereal frown, low sneering good, half mirror malice and half whim, a fiend in glee ridiculously grim, each signet sweet of Bath and Tunbridge race, whose tuneful whistling makes the waters pass, each songster riddler every nameless name, all crowd who foremost shall be damned to fame. Some strain in rhyme, the muses on their racks scream like the wind winding of ten thousand jacks. Some free from rhyme or reason, rule or check, break Priscian's head and Pegasus's neck. Down, down the larnum with impetuous whirl, the pinders and the miltons of a curl. Silence ye wolves, while Ralph to Cynthia howls, and makes night hideous, answer him ye owls. Sense, speech, a measure, living tongues and dead, let all give way, a Morris may be read. Flow, Wellstead, flow, like thine inspirer beer, thou stale, not ripe, thou thin, not yet never clear, so sweetly mawkish and so smoothly dull, heady, not strong, a flowering, though not full. Ah, Dennis, Gildan, ah, what ill-starred rage Divides a friendship long confirmed by age. Blockheads with reason, wicked wits abhor. But fool with fool is barbarous civil war. Embrace, embrace, my sons, be foes no more, Nor glad vile poets with true critics gore. Behold yon pair in strict embraces joined, How like in manners and how like in mind. Equal in wit and equally polite, shall this a pasquin, that a grumbler write. Like are their merits, like rewards they share, that shines a counsel, this commissioner. But who is he in closet close pent, of sober face with learned dust besprent? Right well mine eyes are read the meister white. On parchment scraps he fed a wormius height. To future ages may thy dullness last, as thou preservest the dullness of the past. There, dimming clouds, the pouring sc scolias mark, wits who like owls see only in the dark. A lumber house of books in every head, for ever reading, never to be read. But where each science lifts its modern type, history her pot, divinity her pipe, while proud philosophy repines to show dishonest sight, his breeches rent below. 
embrowned with native bronze, low Henley stands, tuning his voice and balancing his hands. How fluent nonsense trickles from his tongue, how sweet the periods neither said nor sung. Still break the benches, Henley, with thy strain, while Sherlock Hare and Gibson preach in vain. O great restorer of the good old stage, preacher at once and lay zany of thy age. O worthy thou of Egypt's wise abodes, a decent priest where monkeys were the gods. But fate with butchers place thy priestly stall, meek modern faith to murder, hack and maul, and bade thee live to crown Britannia's praise in Tolland, Tyndall's and in Wolfson's days. Yet, O oh, my sons, a father words attend, so may the fates preserve the ears you lend. Tis at yours a bacon or a lock to blame, a Newton's genius or a Milton's flame. But oh, with one immortal one dispense, the source of Newton's light, of Bacon's sense, content each emanation of his fires, that beams on earth each virtue he inspires, each art he prompts, each charm he can create, whate'er he brings are given for you to hate. Persist by all divine in man and ord, but learn ye dunces not to scorn your God. Thus he for then a ray of reason stole, half through the solid darkness of his soul, but soon the cloud returned and thus the sire, see now what dullness and her sons admire, see what the charms that smite the simple heart, not touched by nature and not reached by art. His never blushing head he turned aside, not half so pleased when Goodman prophesied, and looked and saw a sable saucer arise, swift to whose hand a winged volume flies. All sudden gorgons hiss and dragons glare, and ten-horned fiends and giants rush to war. Hell rises, heaven descends, and dance on earth. Gods, imps, and monsters, music, rage, and mirth. A fire, a jig, a battle, and a ball, till one wide conflagration swallows all, thence a new world to nature's laws unknown breaks out refulgent with a heaven its own another cynthia her new journey runs and other planets circle other suns the forests dance the rivers upward rise whales sport in woods and dolphins in the skies and last to give the whole creation grace lo one vast egg produces human race Joy fills his soul, joy innocent of thought. What power, he cries, what power these wonders wrought. Son, what thou seek'st is in thee, look and find. Each monster meets his likeness in thy mind. Yet wouldst thou more in yonder cloud behold, whose sarsenet skirts are edged with flamy gold. A matchless youth, his nod these worlds controls, Wings the red lightning and the thunder rolls, angel of dullness sent to scatter round her magic charms o'er all unclassic ground. Yon stars, yon suns he rears at pleasure higher, illumes their light and sets their flames on fire. Immortal rich, how calm he sits at ease, mid snows of paper and fierce hail of peas and proud his mistress orders to perform rides in the whirlwind and directs the storm but lo the dark encounter in mid-air new wizards rise i see my sibber there booth in his cloudy tabernacle shrined on grinning dragons thou shalt mount the wind dire is the conflict dismal is the din here shouts all Drury, there all Lincoln's in, contending theatres our empire raise, alike their labours and alike their praise. And are these wonders son to the unknown, unknown to thee, these wonders are thy own, these fate reserved to grace thy reign divine, foreseen by me, but ah, withheld from mine, in Lud's old walls, though long I ruled renowned, far as loud those stupendous bells resound, Though my own alderman conferred the bays to me committing their eternal praise, their full-fed heroes, their pacific mayors, their annual trophies and their monthly wars, 
Though long my party built on me their hopes for writing pamphlets and for roasting popes, yet lo in me what authors have to brag on, reduced at last to hiss in my own dragon. Avert it, heaven, that thou, my sibber heir, shouldst wag a serpent tail in Smithfield fair, like the vile straw that's blown through about the streets, and the needy poet sticks to all he meets. Coached, carted, trod upon, now loose, now fast, and carried off in some dog's tail at last. Happier thy fortunes like a rolling stone, thy giddy dullness still shall lumber on. Safe in its heaviness shall never stray, but lick up every blockhead in the way. Thee shall the patriot, thee the courtier taste, and every year be duller than the last till raised from booths to theatre to court, her seat imperial dullness shall transport. Already opera prepares the way, the sure forerunner of her gentle sway. Let her, thy heart, next drabs and dice engage, the third mad passion of thy doting age. Teach thou the warbling polypheme to roar, and scream thyself as none e'er screamed before, to aid our cause in heaven thou canst not bend, hell thou shalt move, for Faustus is our friend, Pluto with Cato, thou for this shalt join, and link the morning bride to prosper pine. Grub Street thy fall, should men and gods conspire, thy stage shall stand and shore it but from fire. Another Aeschylus appears, prepare for new abortions, all ye pregnant fair, in flames like Semele is be brought to bed, while opening hell spouts wild fire at your head. Now, Bavius, take the poppy from thy brow, and place it here, here, all ye heroes bow. This is he foretold by ancient rhymes, the Augustus born to bring Saturnian times. Signs following signs lead on the mighty year. See the dull stars roll round and reappear. See, see, our own true Phoebus wears the bays. Our Midas sits Lord Chancellor of the plays. On poet's tomb see Benson's titles writ. Lo, Ambrose Phillips is preferred for wit. See under Ripley rise a new white hall, while Jones and Boyle's united labours fall. While Wren with sorrow to the grave descends, Gay dies unpensioned with a hundred friends. Hibernian politics, oh swift thy fate and popes ten years to comment and translate. Proceed, great days, till learning fly the shore, till birch shall blush with noble blood no more, till ten sea-eaten sons forever play, till Westminster whole year be holiday, till Isis elders reel their pupils sport, and alma mater lie dissolved in port. Enough, enough the raptured monarch cries, and through the ivory gate the vision flies. Oh, and there you have uh, Pope's dystopian vision uh, in that last stanza there. So, where are we up to? Book the Fourth, Argument. The poet being in this book to declare the completion of the prophecies mentioned at the end of the former makes a new invocation, as the great poets are wont, when some high and worthy matter is to be sung. He shows the goddess coming in her majesty to destroy order and science and to substitute the kingdom of the dull upon earth. How she leads captive the sciences and silent the muses, and what they be who succeed in their stead. All her children by a wonderful attraction are drawn about her and bear along with them diverse others who promote her empire by connivance, weak resistance or discouragement of arts, such as half-wits, tasteless admirers, vain pretenders, the flatterers of dunces or the patrons of them. All these crowd round her 
one of them offering to approach her is driven back by a rival, but she commends and encourages both. The first who speak in four are the geniuses of the schools who assure her of their care to advance her cause by confining youth to words and keeping them out of the way of real knowledge. Their address and her gracious answer with her charge to them and the universities. The universities appear by their proper deputies and assure her that the same method is observed in the progress of education. The speech of Aristarchus on this subject, they are driven off by a band of young gentlemen returned from travel with their tutors, one of whom delivers to the goddess in a polite oration an account of the whole conduct and fruits of their travels, presenting to her at the same time a young nobleman perfectly accomplished. She receives him graciously and endues him with the happy quality of want of shame. She sees loitering about her a number of indolent persons abandoning all business and duty and dying with laziness. To these approach, but Mummius, another antiquary, complaining of his fraudulent proceeding, she finds a method to reconcile their difference. Then enter a troop of people fantastically adorned, offering her strange and exotic presents. Amongst them, one stands forth and demands justice on another, who had deprived him of one of the greatest curiosities in nature. But he justifies himself so well that the goddess gives them both her appropriation. She recommends to them to find proper employment for the indolence before mentioned in the study of butterflies, shells, birds, nests, moss, etc. But with particular caution not to proceed beyond trifles to any useful or extensive views of nature or of the author of nature. Against the last of these apprehensions, she is secured by a hearty address from the minute philosophers and free thinkers, one of whom speaks in the name of the rest. The youth thus instructed and principled are delivered to her in a body by the hands of Silenus, and then admitted to taste the cup of the Magus, her high priest, which causes a total oblivion of all obligations, divine, civil, moral or rational. To these her adepts she sends priests, attendants and comforters of various kinds, confers on them orders and decrees, and then dismissing them with a speech confirming to each his privileges and telling that she expects from each concludes with a yawn of extraordinary virtue. The progress and effects whereof on all orders of men and the consummation of all in the restoration of night and chaos conclude the poem. Blimey, are you ready for this? Here we go. Yet, yet a moment, one dim ray of light, indulge dread chaos and eternal night, of darkness visible so much be lent, as half to show, half veil the deep intent. Ye powers whose mysteries restored I sing, to whom time bears me on his rapid wing, suspend a while your force inertly strong, then take at once the poet and the song. Now flamed the dog stars and propitious ray, smote every brain and withered every bay. Sick was the sun, the owl forsook his bower, the moon struck prophet felt the madding hour, then rose the seed of chaos and of night, to blot out order and extinguish light, of dull and venal a new world to mould, and bring Saturnian days of lead and gold. She mounts the throne, her head a cloud concealed, in broad effulgence all below revealed. Tis thus aspiring dullness ever shines, soft on her lap her laureate sun reclines. Beneath her footstool, science groans in chains, and wit dreads exile, penalties and pains. There foamed rebellious logic, gagged and bound. There stripped, fair rhetoric languished on the ground. His blunted arms by sophistry are borne, and shameless Billingsgate her robes adorn. Morality by her false guardians drawn, chicane in furs 
and causatory in lawn. Gasps as they straighten at each end of the cord and dies when dullness gives her page the word. Mad Mathesis alone was unconfined, too mad for mere material chains to bind. Now to pure space lifts her ecstatic stare, now running round the circle finds its square. But held in tenfold bonds the muses lie, watch both by envies and by flattery's eye. There to her heart sad tragedy addressed, the dagger won't to pierce the tyrant's breast. But sober history restrained her rage and promised vengeance on a barbarous age. There sunk Thalia, nerveless, cold and dead, had not her sister satire held her head? Nor couldst thou, Chesterfield, a tear refuse? Thou wept, and with thee wept each gentle muse. When lower harlot form, soft sliding by, with mincing step, small voice and languid eye, foreign her air, her robes, discordant pride in patchwork fluttery, and her head aside by singing peers upheld on either hand she tripped and laughed too pretty much to stand cast on the prostrate nine a scornful look then thus in quaint recitative spoke o oh, cara cara silence all that train joy to great chaos let division reign Chromatic tortures soon shall drive them hence, break all their nerves and fritter all their sense. One trill shall harmonise joy, grief and rage, wake the dull church and lull the ranting stage. To the same notes thy son shall hum or snore, and all thy yawning daughters cry, encore. Another Phoebus, thy own Phoebus reign, Joys in my jigs and dances in my chains, but soon our soon rebellion will commence, since music meanly borrows aid from sense. Strong in new arms, low giant handle stands, like bold Briarius with a hundred hands, to stir, to rouse, to shake the soul he comes, and Jove's own thunders follow Mars's drums. Arrest him, impress, or you sleep no more. She heard and drove him to the Hibernian shore. And now had fame's posterior trumpet blown, and all the nations summoned to the throne, the young, the old, who feel her inward sway, one instinct seizes and transports away. None see a guide by sure attraction led, and strong impulsive gravity of head. None want a place for all their centre found, hung to the goddess and cohered around, not closer orb in orb, conglobed are seen, the buzzing bees about their dusky queen. The gathering number as it moves along involves a vast involuntary throng, throng who gently drawn and struggling less and less, roll in her vortex and her power confess, not those alone who passive own her laws, but who weak rebels more advance her cause, what air of dunce in college or in town, sneers at another in toupee or gown, what air o oh, mongrel no one class admits, a wit with dunces and a dunce with wits. Nor absent they, no members of her state, who pay her homage in her sons the great, who false to Phoebus bow the knee to bow, or impious preach his word without a call, patrons who sneak from living worth to dead, without the pension and set up the head, or vestal flattery in the sacred gown, or give from fool to fool the laurel crown, and last and worse, with all the cant of wit, with the soul, the muses, hypocrite. 
There marched the bard and blockhead side by side, who rhymed for hire and patronised for pride. Narcissus praised with all a parson's power, looked a white lily sunk beneath a shower. There moved Montalto with superior air, his stretched out arm displayed a volume fair. Courtiers and patriots in two ranks divide, through both he passed and bowed from side to side. But as in graceful act with awful eye, composed he stood, bold Benson thrust him by. On two unequal crutches propped he came, Milton's on this, on that one Johnston's name. The decent knight retired with sober rage, withdrew his hand and closed the pompous page. But happy for him as the times went then, appeared Apollo's mare and older men, on whom three hundred gold cap youths await to lug the ponderous volume off in state when diana smiling thus revived the wits but murder first and mince them all to bits as s media cruel so to save a new edition of old eson gave let standard authors thus like trophies born appear more glorious as more hacked and torn and you, my critics in the chequered shade, admire new light through holes yourself have made. Leave not a foot of verse, a foot of stone, a page, a grave, that they can call their own. But spread, my sons, your glory, thin or thick, on passive paper or on solid brick. So by each bard and alderman should sit, a heavy lord shall hang at every wit. And while on fame's triumphal car they ride, some slave of mind be pinioned to their side. Now crowds on crowds around the goddess press, each eager to present the first address. Dunce scorning gunt dunce beholds the next advance. But fop shows fop superior complaisance. When lo, a spectre rose whose index hand held forth the virtue of the dev de dreadful wand. His beavered brow a birch and garland wears, dropping with infant's blood and mother's tears. O'er every rain a shuddering horror runs, eaten and went and shake through all their sons. All flesh is humbled, Westminster's bold race, shrink and confess the genius of the place. The pale boy senator yet tingling stands and holds his breeches close with both his hands. Then thus, since man from beast by words is known, words are man's province, words we teach alone. When reason doubtful, like the Samian letter, points in two ways, the narrower is the better. Placed at the door of learning, youth to guide, we never suffer it to stand too wide. To ask, to guess, to know as they commence, as fancy opens the quick springs of sense, we ply the memory, we load the brain, blind rebel wit and double chain on chain, confine the thought to exercise the breath and keep them in the pale of words till death. Whate'er the talents or how designed, we hang one jingling padlock on the mind. A poet, the first day he dips his quill, and what the last, a very poet still. Pity the charm works only in our wall. Loss, loss too soon in yonder house or hall. There, true and windham, every muse gave o'er. There Talbot sunk and was a wit no more. How sweet and ovid Murray was our boast. How many marshals were in Pultenay lost. Else sure some bard to our eternal praise in twice ten thousand rhyming nights and days had reached the work that all that mortal can and south beheld that masterpiece of man. Oh, cried the goddess with some pedant brain, some gentle James to bless the land again, to stick the doctor's chair into the throne, give law to words or war with words alone senates and courts with greek and latin rule and turn the council to a grammar school for sure if dullness sees a grateful day tis in the shade of arbitrary sway oh if my sons may learn one earthly thing 
teach but that one sufficient for a king that which my priests and mine alone maintain which as it dies or lives we fall or reign may you may cam and isis preach it long the right divine of kings to govern wrong prompt at the call around the goddess roll broad hats and hoods and caps a sable shoal thick and more thick the black blockade extends a hundred head of aristotle's friends nor were thou isis wanting to the day thou christ church long kept prudishly away each staunch polemic stubborn as a rock each fear logician still expelling lock came whip and spur and dash through thin and thick on german cruisers and dutch burgers dyke as many quit the streams that murmuring fall to the lull the sons of margaret and clare hall when bentley late tempestuous woke to sport in troubled waters but now sleeps in port before them marched that awful aristarch ploughed was his front with many a deep remark his hat which never veiled to human pride walker with reverence took and laid aside low bowed the rest he kingly did not nod so upright quakers please both man and god mistress dismiss that rabble from your throne avaunt is aristarchus yet unknown thy mighty scholiast whose unwearied pains made horace dull and humbled milton's strains turn what they will to verse their toil is vain critics like me shall make it prose again roman and greek grammarians know you better author of something yet more great than letter while towering are your alphabet like soil stands our digama and urta tops them all tis true on words is still our whole debate disputes of me or t or out or at to sound or sink in cana o or a or give up cicero to c or k let friend affect to speak as terence spoke and also never but like horace joke for me what virgil pliny may deny manilus and solinus shall supply for attic phrase in plato let them seek i poach in pseudus for unlicensed greek in ancient sense in any needs will deal be sure i give them fragments not a meal what gallius or stubius hashed before or chewed by blind old scholiasts o'er and o'er the critic eye that microscope of wit sees hairs and pores examines bit by bit how parts relate to parts or they to whole the body's harmony the beaming soul are things which custer berman wassa shall see when man's whole frame is obvious to a flea ah think not mistress more true dullness lies in folly's cap than wisdom's grave disguise like boys that never sink into the flood on learning surface we but lie and nod thine is the genuine head of many a house and much divinity without a greek mouse nor could a barrow work on every block nor has one a to very spoiled the flock see still thy own the heavy cannon roll and metaphysic smokes involve the pole for thee we dim the eyes and stuff the head with all such reading as was never read for thee explain a thing till all men doubt it and write about it goddess and about it so spins the silkworm small its slender store and labors till it clouds itself all are what though we let some better sort of fool thrid every science run every school never by tumbler through the hoops was shown such skill in passing all and touching none he may indeed if sober all this time plague with dispute or persecute with wine we only furnish what he cannot use or wed to what he must divorce amuse fall in the midst of euclid dip at once and petrify a genius to a dunce or set on metaphysic ground to prance show all his paces not a step advance with the same cement ever sure to bind we bring to one dead level every mind then take him to develop if you can and hew the block off 
and get out the man for wherefore waste i words i see advance whore pupil and lace governor from france walker our hat nor more he deigned to say but stern as age expecter strode away in flowed at once a gay embroidered race and tittering pushed the pedants off the place some would have spoken but the voice was drowned by the french horn or by the opening hound the first came forwards with an easy mane as if he saw saint james and the queen when thus the attendant orator begun receive great emperance thy accomplished son thine from the birth and sacred from the rod a dauntless infant never scared with god the sire saw one by one his virtues wake the mothers begged the blessing of a rake thou gavest that ripeness which so soon began and see so soon he ne'er was boy nor man through school and college thy cow kind cloud o'er cast safe and unseen the young Aeneas passed thence bursting glorious all at once let down stunned with his giddy larum half the town intrepid then o'er seas and lands he flew europe he saw and europe saw him too there all thy gifts and graces we display thou all thou directing all our way to where the same obsequious as she runs pours at great bourbon's feet her silken sons or tiber now no longer roman rolls vain of italian arts italian souls to happy convents bosom deep in vines where slumber abbots purple as their wines to isles of fragrance lily-livered veils diffusing languor in the panting gales to lands of singing or of dancing slaves love whispering woods and lute resounding waves but chief her shrine where naked venus keeps and cupids ride the lion of the deeps where eased of fleets the adriatic main wafts the smooth eunuch an enamoured swain led by my hand he sauntered europe round and gathered every vice on christian ground saw every court heard every king declare his royal sense of operas or the fair the stews and the palace equally explored intrigued with glory and with spirit awed tried all hors d'oeuvre all liqueurs defined judicious drank and greatly daring dined dropped the dull lumber of the latin store spoiled his own language and acquired no more all classic learning lost on classic ground and last turned air the echo of a sound see now half cured and perfectly well bred with nothing but a solo in his head as each estate and principle and wit as jansen fleetwood sibber shall think fit stolen from a jewel followed by a nun and if a borough choose him not undone see to my country happy i restore this glorious youth and add one venus more her to receive for her my soul adores so may the sons of sons of sons of whores prop thine o empress like each neighbour throne and make a long posterity thy own please she accepts the hero the dame wraps in her veil and frees from sense of shame then looked and saw a lazy lolling sort unseen at church at senate or at court of ever listless loiterers that attend of no cause no trust no duty and no friend thee too my paradel she marked thee there stretched on the rack of a too easy chair and heard thy everlasting yawn confess the pains and penalties of idleness she pitied but her pity only shed benigner influence on thy nodding head but Anius, crafty seer with ebon wand and well assembled emerald on his hand false as his gems <coughs> and cankered as his coins <coughs> came crammed with capon from where polio dies soft as with wily fox <coughs> is seen to creep where bask on sunny banks the simple sheep walk round and round now prying here now there so he but pious whispered first his prayer <coughs> grant gracious goddess grant me still to cheat oh may thou cloud still cover the deceit 
thy choice amiss on this assembly shed, but pour them thickest on the noble head. So shall each youth, assisted by our eyes, see other Caesars, other Homers rise, through twilight ages hunt the Athenian fowl, with Chelsea's gods and mortals call an owl. Now see an Attis, now a Cecrops clear, nay, mummet the pigeon at thine ear. Be rich in ancient brass, though not in gold, and keep his lairs, though his house be sold. To headless Phoebe, his fair bride postpone, honour a Syrian prince above his own. Lord of an Otho, if I vouch it true, blessed in one Niger, till he knows of two. Mummius overheard him, Mummius full renowned, who like his Cheops stinks above the ground, fierce as a startled adder, swelled and said, rattling an ancient sistrum at his head. Speaks thou of Syrian prince, traitor base, mine goddess, mine is all the horned race. True, he had wit to make their value rise, from foolish Greeks to steal them as wise, more glorious yet from barbarous hands to keep, when Sally Rovers chased him on the deep, then taught by Hermes and divinely bold, down his own throat he risked the Grecian gold, received each demigod with pious care, deep in his entrails I revered them there, I brought them shrouded in that Irving shrine, and at their second birth they issue mine. Witness great Ammon, by whose horns I swore, replied soft Aeneas, this our paunch before still bears them faithful, and that thus I eat is to refund the medals with the meat, to prove me goddess clear of all design, bid me with polio sup as well as dine. There all the learned shall at the labour stand, and Douglas lend his soft, obstetric hand. The goddess smiling seemed to give consent, so back to polio hand in hand they went. Then thick as locusts blackening all the ground, a tribe with weeds and shells fantastic crowned, each with some wondrous gift approached the power, a nest, a toad, a fungus or a flower, but far the foremost, too, with earnest zeal and aspect ardent to the throne appeal. <coughs> The first thus opened, hear thy suppliant's call, great queen and common mother of us all. Fair from its humble bed I reared this flower, suckled and cheered with air and sun and shower. Soft on the paper rough its leaves I spread, bright with a gilded button tipped its head, then throned in glass and named it Caroline. Each maid cried, charming, and each youth divine. Did nature's pencil ever blend such rays, such varied light in one promiscuous blaze? Now prostrate, dead, behold that Caroline. No maid cries, charming, and no youth divine. And lo, the wretch whose vile, whose insect lust laid this gay daughter of the spring in dust. O oh, punish him, or to the Lycian shades, dismiss my soul when no carnation fades. He ceased and wept with innocence of main. The queue stood forth and thus addressed the queen. <clears throat> of all the enamelled race whose silvery wing waves to the tepid zephyrs of the spring or swims along the fluid atmosphere, once bright as shined this child of heat and air, I saw and started from its vernal bower the rising game and chased from flower to flower. It fled, it followed, now in hope, now pain. It stopped, I stopped, it moved, I moved again. At last it fixed, twas on what plant it pleased. And there it fixed, the beauteous bird I seize. Rose or carnation was below my care. I meddle, goddess, only in my sphere. I tell the naked fact without disguise, and to excuse it need but show the prize. Who spoils this paper offers to your eye. Fair even in death, this peerless butterfly. <clears throat> My son, she answered, both have done your parts, live happy both and long promote our arts. But here a mother, when she recommends to your fraternal care our sleeping friends, the common soul of heaven's more frugal make serves but to keep fools pert and knaves awake. 
a drowsy watchman that just gives a knock and breaks our rest to tell us what's o'clock. Yet by some object every brain is stirred, the dull may waken to a hummingbird, the most recluse discreetly opened find congenial matter in the cockle kind, the mind in metaphysics at a loss may wander in a wilderness of moss, the head that turns at superlunar things, poised with a tail, may steer on Wilkins' wings. <clears throat> Oh, would the sons of men once think their eyes and reason given them but to study flies, see nature in some partial narrow shape, and let the author of the whole escape learn but to trifle, or who most observe, to wonder at their maker, not to serve. Be that my task, replies a gloomy clerk, sworn foe to mystery yet divinely dark, whose pious hope aspires to see the day when moral evidence shall quite decay and damns implicit face and holy lies, prompt to impose and fond to dogmatise. Let others creep by timid steps and slow, on plain experience lay foundations low, by common sense to common knowledge bred, and last to nature's cause through nature led. All seeing in thy miss, we want no guide, mother of arrogance and source of pride. We nobly take the high priori road and reason downward, till we doubt of God, make nature still encroach upon his plan, and shove him off as far as e'er we can, thrust some mechanic cause into his place, or bind in matter, or diffuse in space, or at one bound, or leaping all his laws, make God man's image, man the final cause, find virtue local, or relation scorn, see all in self, and but for self be born, of naught so certain as our reason still, of naught so doubtful as of soul and will. Oh, hide the gods still more and make us see, such as Lucretius drew, a god like thee, wrapped up in self, a god without a thought, regardless of our merit or default, or that bright image to our fancy draw, which Theocles in raptured vision saw, while through poetic scenes the genius rose or wanders wild in academic groves, that nature our society adores when Tyndall dictates and Silenus snores. Roused as his name uprose the Bowsy sire, and shook from out his pipe the seeds of fire, then snapped his box and stroked his belly down, rosy and reverend, though without a gown, bland and familiar to the throne he came, led up the youth and called the goddess dame, then thus from priestcraft happily set free, lo, every finished son returns to thee, first slave to words, then vassal to a name, then dupe to party, child and man the same, bounded by nature, narrowed still by art, a trifling head and a contracted heart, thus bred, thus taught, how many have I seen, smiling on all, and smiled on by a queen, marked out for honours, honoured for their birth, to thee the most rebellious things on earth, now to thy so be sneaked into the grave, a monarch's half and half a harlot's slave, poor W. nipped in folly's broadest bloom, who praises now his chaplain on his tomb, then take them all, oh, take them to thy breast, thy majus goddess shall perform the rest. With that a wizard old his cup extends, which whoso tastes forgets his former friends, sire, ancestors, himself, one casts his eyes up to a star, and like Edimon dies, a feather shooting from another's head, extracts his brain and principle is fled. Lost is his God, his country, everything, and nothing left but homage to a king. The vulgar herd turn off to roll with hogs, to run with horses or to hunt with dogs. But sad example, never to escape, their infamy still keep the human shape. But she, good goddess, sent to every child, firm impudence, and stupefaction mild, and straight succeeded, leaving shame no room, Siberian forehead and Sumerian gloom. Kind self-conceit to some her glass applies, 
which no one looks in with another's eyes, but as the flatterer or dependent paint beholds himself a patriot, chief or saint. On others' interest her gay livery flings, interest that waves on party-coloured wings. Turn to the sun, she casts the thousand dyes, and as she turns, the colours fall or rise. Others, the Syrian sisters, warble round, and empty heads console with empty sound. No more, alas, the voice of fame they hear, the balm of dullness trickling in their ear. Great C H P R K. Why all your toils your sons have learned to sing? How quick ambition hastes to ridicule. The sire is made a peer, the son a fool. On some a priest succinct in anise white, attends all flesh is nothing in his sight. Beaves at his touch at once to jelly turn, and the huge boar is shrunk into an urn. The board with specious miracles he loads, turns hares to larks and pigeons into toads. Another for all, in all, what one can shine, explains the save, the verdure of the vine. What cannot copious sacrifice atone? Thy truffles, perigord, thy hams, thy on. With French libation and Italian strain, wash blade and white and expiate hay stain. Night lifts the head, for what are crowds undone, to the essential partridges in one. Gone every blush, and silent all reproach, contending princes mount them in their coach. Next, bidding all draw near on bended knees, the queen confers her titles and degrees. Her children first, of more distinguished sort, who study Shakespeare at the inns of court, impale a glow warm, or virtue profess, shrine in the dignity of FRS. Some deep Freemasons join the silent race, worthy to fill Pythagoras' place, some botanists or florists at the least, or issue members of an annual feast, nor past the meanest unregarded, one rose a Gregorian, one a Gormorgan, the last, not least, in honour or applause, Isis and Cam made doctors of her laws. Then blessing all, go children of my care, to practice now from theory repair. All my commands are easy, short and full. My sons be proud, be selfish and be dull. Guard my prerogative, assert my throne. This nod confirms each privilege your own. The cap and switch be scared to his grace. With staff and pumps, the Marquis lead the race. From stage to stage, the licensed Earl may run, paired with his fellow charioteer, the sun. The learned Baron butterfly's design or draw to silk Arachne's sub subtile line. The judge to dance, his brother sergeant call. The senator at cricket urge the ball. The bishop stow pontific luck and a hundred souls of turkeys in a pie, the sturdy squire to Gallic master's soup, stoop, and drown his lands and manners in a soup. Others import yet nobler arts from France, teach kings to fiddle and make senates dance. Perhaps more high some daring son may soar, proud to my list to add one monarch more, and nobly conscious princes are but things, Born for first ministers as slaves for kings, tyrant supreme shall three estates command and make one mighty dunciad of the land. More she had spoke but yawned all nature nods. What mortal can resist the yawn of gods? Churches and chapels instantly it reached. St. James first for leaden Gilbert preached. Then catched the schools, the hall scarce kept awake. The convocation gaped but could not speak. Lost was the nation's sense, nor could be found. While the long solemn unison went round. Wide and more wide it spread o'er all the realm. Even Pilanurus nodded at the helm. The vapour mild o'er each committee crept, and finished treaties in each office slept. And chiefless armies dozed about the campaign, and navvies yawned for orders on the main. O oh, muse relate, for you can tell alone, wits have short memories, and dunces none. Relate, 
who first, who last resigned to rest, whose head she partly, who's completely blessed, what charms could faction, what ambition lull, the venal quiet and entrance the dull. Till drowned was sense and shame and right and wrong. Oh, sing and hush the nations with thy song. In vain, in vain, the all-encompassing hour. Resistless falls, the muse obeys the power. She comes, she comes, the sable throne, behold, of night primeval and of chaos old. Before her, fancies, gilded clouds decay, and all its varying rainbows die away. Wit shoots in vain its momentary fires, the meteor drops and in a flash expires. As one by one, at dread media strain, the sickening stars fade off the ethereal plain. As Argus eyes by Hermes wand oppressed, close one by one to everlasting rest. Thus, at her felt approach and secret might, art after art goes out and all is night. Sea skulking truth to her old cavern fled, mountains of causetry heaped on her head. Philosophy that leaned on heaven before shrinks to her second cause and is no more. Physic of metaphysic begs defence and metaphysic calls for aid on sense. See mystery to mathematics fly. In vain they gaze, turn giddy, rave and die. Religion blushing veils her sacred fires, and unawares morality expires. Nor public flame, nor private dares to shine. Nor human spark is left, nor glimpse divine. Lo, thy dread empire, chaos is restored. Light dies before thy uncreating word. Thy hand, great Anak, lets the curtain fall, and universal darkness buries all. this civil lawsuit and a lot of the techniques that we see in this cult are very similar to the techniques that our government used in the MK Ultra program. He was a branding women with case initials and they were like well what's what's the bad thing exactly about that? Everyone on the outside world aka the real world is like they're branding women so I left I went to the executive board and I said I want my photos back I want my videos back the branding session was filmed I want all of that back, I want my collateral back. None of that happened. And it's, it's the same fear, mind control, and you'll be destroyed if you cross, get into the upper elites. And if you get to that point, if you start revealing anything, they have the same system to completely destroy you, destroy your career, blackmail you like Epstein, keep you, uh, catch you, film you in compromising positions. Uh, and, and, and this goes both uh, within Hollywood and celebrities and some of the elite. And it also goes on in Congress and the Senate. And if they even insinuate that they're going to reveal some of these things, they're done. A lot of people here tonight felt like they lost. You know why? Because y'all been lied to. Google lied to you. Google. Facebook lied to you. Radio lied to you. The powerful people that be, whether it's the music industry or the movie industry, you are only allowed a certain level of success if you are willing to join their club. If you're willing to be part of their secret society or if you're compromised, they will not let someone obtain a lot of fame in, and power if they can't control you. A classic example, at least for me, is Katy Perry. Katy Perry was, was a gospel singer, very talented, uh, but she was going nowhere. And she got up to Hollywood and, and basically they said, you want to be a success? You play by our rules. You step into the occult and you start putting that in your videos. And now she's doing videos with her in hell with satanic themes and she's what? 
highly successful. You see that over with Lady Gaga, who, who came out and actually said she was so tired of being handled and manipulated, she had to take a break. That this is this young, outrageous girl wear strange clothes. She's into extremes. She's experimental. She uh, have 43 million people on the Twitter following her, whatever she do, little monsters. And she came really very humble to my house and asked me if I can teach her. We made this workshop in the woods and she was such a good student. She never cheated. She really went much farther than I asked her for. She is a limitless human being. As myself, a self-proclaimed mm. pop performance artist, want to go home and slit my wrists and, and I, you know, I am nothing. I have achieved no sense of art. Uh, she is, she is so boundless. I heard the, the, the performance because Lady Gaga from one time started to be interested in my work. So I went through from the, I think, normal culture to mass culture. Marina Abramovic, of course, is in the Podesta emails and she's the one that conducts the spirit cooking dinners. She said that Marina did an exercise with her where she stripped her completely naked and left her in the middle of the woods to fend for herself and find her way back. Those are the kinds of things that people who are behind the MK Ultra programs do to children that they're mind controlling. We know Marina Abramovic is a Satanist. You Google Marina Abramovic's name in spirit cooking and you will find hundreds of pictures of Marina Abramovic's events where they will have, for example, a cake that looks like a human being and they'll depict human cannibalism. And they claim they're not engaging in cannibalism. And you will find A-list actors and famous politicians and other very famous and successful, powerful business people at her events. They literally have food that look like human beings on dinner tables. He's Italian and Greek, I mean, you know. <laughs> and a very good cook. And a very good cook. And I'm sure there's something very nefarious about that risotto recipe. So... After I started researching that call, I learned that Satanists believe that they have to reveal who they are in some way, shape, or form. So that is why we see a lot of these occult members in Hollywood constantly flaunting symbolism. We see the pyramid, the Illuminati pyramid a lot. We see the evil one eye constantly. It's always on the cover of magazines. We see these are supposed to be the 666 devil symbols. We constantly see those symbols. We also see pedophile symbols, the swirl or the triangle within a triangle. I guarantee this wasn't his first. And we also see a lot of these members of the cult go on their social media and they talk about raping children. They talk about worshiping Satan and people write it off as a joke. But they're not joking. I don't care if you're a major comedian. You can't tell me that's funny because there is no joke about raping children that's funny. You don't know what that is. I have no idea. Well, you don't know. Jimmy Fallon doesn't know. David Letterman doesn't know. Well, we don't know. All the comics and show business don't know what this is. takes guts to put out a film that does this because no one's done it up until now. But when that's done and people see these facts and they say, my gosh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that about the Gulf of Tonkin. I didn't know that about the Vietnam, Vietnam War. Um, my gosh. And they go in, they check it out, and it's all true. And now they're seeing the dots. Uh, and and uh, a, a good film will teach them how to practice critical thinking, to analyze what you're watching. If we can get people to analyze what they're watching, we've crossed a huge hurdle. Because once they start analyzing it, they're going to see the dots, and, and typically the dots will connect themselves. Liz Crokin put herself so far out in front that she was mocked. She was laughed at. She was called crazy. Well, let me ask you a question. For all those people that did that to Liz, does she seem so crazy now? When you put all of those facts together and you use critical thinking, you realize this stuff is real. 
There's not one smoking gun. There's many small smoking guns that you have to piece together and you have to use critical thinking to understand this stuff is real. So again, the bigger question is, now that Jeffrey Epstein's been exposed and he's allegedly dead, how many of his friends that were frequent visitors on his sex trafficking island were also involved in the rape, torture, and trafficking of children? And that's what Pizzagate is. I guess what I'm asking you all to do is just disconnect for a second, stand back, look at the lyrics of your songs, look at the agendas of the movies, look at the messages of the media that you're absorbing. Because it's impossible to say that all of it's bad, like all of Hollywood's bad. That's not true. Like It's like saying all of the CIA is bad. There's a lot of good people that work in both industries that, 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 that aren't bad people. But if the people that control the narratives and the agendas are not good people and they have different agendas, they can put that on you and you won't even notice it unless you stand back and look at things objectively. I can't compromise anymore. Um, that for me, that's not what life's about. I want to send a good message to my kids and I want them to know that at the end of the day, their dad did what was right and their dad fought for the good things in life. If I could ever get the opportunity to make movies that send out good messages, and then people start realizing that they can be good and that there are, they can jump on the bandwagon of good, that that's the next phase. People start believing it. It's the same thing with desensitizing with the violence. People start believing that it's okay to kill somebody or watching somebody die isn't a big deal. You start, when people aren't helping other people in need on the streets, there's a problem in this world. But this could, this could all be changed right now. The reason why I'm doing this documentary is because I wanna be one of the first people to come out and say, hey, it doesn't have to be like this. We are good people, humans are good, and we can make the world a better place because the, the money and the technology to make this world a better place is there. It's just been covered up and controlled for so long that it's time for it all to come out. And maybe I'm the catalyst for something better. What does the media look like in the future? Well, to me, what I would hope is that it's not filtered. I would love to build a platform or build some sort of system where artists could connect directly to their audience. I wanna make products and tell stories that bring humanity together, that bring compassion, that bring love, that bring forgiveness, that bring inspiration and courage back to the audience without having the influence of violence or gratuitous sex or gratuitous death or gratuitous horror. Because those are things and images that get stored in our psyche and our soul and I don't think that's the way that this earth was intended to be.